Hello, and welcome to Reflections. I am Rom Gayoso, your host. So first and foremost, uh, thank you so very much for your being here with me and my guests today. I know your time is very, very important, and I am the guy who will make sure it is invested wisely. So today we have two very special guests and I'm sure it will be a very fun show. Uh, our topic is futures literacy with a good dose of social sciences included in the mix. So stay tuned, lots of fun. Uh, well, okay, everybody's got some rules and before I get started with the show proper, I need to cover some rules. So um, let's take care of that first. All writing. So um, we broadcast over a variety of different channels, and they all have slightly different rules concerning the use of chat. And since we make a lot of use of chat, we need to pay very close attention to those requirements. So basically, the rules can be summarized as follows. You know, just be nice, be polite, and be courteous. Uh, there's only one very steadfast, only one golden rule. There's absolutely no hate speech allowed. So by the way, the chat boxes are open. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the chat. So it may be called chat box or chat window. It really depends on the service you are using. Please uh, do say hi and let me know where you're watching from. For our podcast listeners and those watching us via Futures Television, please drop a comment on our YouTube page and I'll make sure to say hi. I do have a very special favor to ask of you. Since there are several chat windows running at the same time, it saves me quite a lot of time if you could please type hashtag ask, that is hashtag A-S-K in front of your question. So this way, when I'm scrolling through the chats or up and down, I can immediately spot your question or your comment and pose it to the guests. There are several ways for you to submit a question. Of course, you can always use the chat if you are online with us live. Uh, you can always email me a question. So please email it to editor at imcimagazine.com or if you prefer to use the talk to text function, just text me a question to 001 for the United States, 480-544-8372. Okay, so privacy rules do apply. I will not save your text or your number. Once it is read, it is deleted. Okay, I guess we can move on to our first order of business, which is always the agenda. So the agenda is basically, you know, what we're going to be, you know, doing today. We're going to have a short introduction. I'm going to talk a little bit about the magazine, about the show, and then I'm going to introduce two guests, Professor Alicia Baena, then Dr. Stefan Bergheim, and then towards uh, the end of the show, um, of course, you can always ask questions during the show, but if you have some last minute burning question, or you have some, some other comment, I have set some time aside towards the end of the show for additional Q&A period. Then, after that, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the upcoming events so you know, you know what else uh, we're going to have or what kind of shows we have next. Okay, so let's um, start with the uh, introduction proper. So we, Reflections, we are the podcast and live stream partner of IMCI Magazine. You can find us online at www.imcimagazine.com. We are published in the United States under registry 2769-0008. We are a member of Edelweiss America Media, and our focus is on intelligence. So competitive intelligence, market intelligence, economic intelligence, and about half of the magazine's content is on foresight of future studies. By the way, the picture on the right-hand side of the slide is actually, you know, 
our current issue, uh, which is on sensing. Our vision is really to bring diverse perspectives and voices uh, to the debate. So I wanted to say uh, just a few words about the topic of the show. Both of my guests today work very, very hard to advance futures literacy, which is the central topic of our discussion. Well, why futures literacy, you may ask, right? So to answer that, I will quote Riel Miller from UNESCO. So basically, he reminds us futures literacy is indeed a capability. And we know how the business world values capabilities, right? So he adds, and I quote from one of his papers, a futures literate person has acquired the skills needed to decide why and how to use their imagination to introduce the non-existent future into the present. So this is a skill or an analytical framework based on a series of anticipatory systems and processes. Well, I know it sounds a bit complicated, but it is rather not. And luckily, my guests today mastered this subject, and they are wonderful teachers. You will soon find out. In one case, one of them will talk about the role of scenic arts to foster creativity. And in another, we will learn to use skills and imagination to put them to our service. So uh, make no mistake about it. We're talking about skills and competencies that will serve you well in your personal life as well as in your professional career. Well, you, you really uh, get the idea, right? So uh, let's get started. I want to uh, introduce uh, my first guest. Let me see a few words about her. So my first guest is uh, Professor Alicia Baena. She's the director at Teach the Future Mexico. She's the founder of the Teatro del Devenir, which translates into forward theater. She's an author, a speaker, and a trainer with a focus on helping people design personal futures. She teaches strategic foresight at the social and political sciences university in Mexico City. And she's also an executive board member of the World Future Studies Federation. So let me uh, bring her uh, into the show. Professora Buena, bienvenida e bienvenidos todos los que nos acompañan desde México. Welcome gracias. to the show. Gracias, gracias. <laughs> I'm so happy uh, to have you here. So uh, we actually um, met at the Berlin conference and I said, oh, I have to bring her to the show. She's uh, <laughs> absolutely fabulous. You know, I, I, I hope I, I didn't do too, too poor of a job at the introduction, uh, but um, I hope I did not miss any important things or aspects of your biography. So please say a, a few words about you and your work. Well, I'm a creator experience. I love to create experiences, uh, either it is personal or professional. And I'm also a mom. So that are two things that I will add to my CV. <laughs> <laughs> That's that. Those are very important jobs. Uh, you know, yeah. being, being, a, being a parent is certainly a, a, a very important job. Sure. So uh, the first uh, question I wanted to uh, ask you a little bit about is I want to get to you or to know you as a futurist. So really, how did you decide your career would be futures focused as opposed to dealing with the present? Well, Rom and audience, first, it was uh, like by osmosis, you know, because my mother is one of the uh, top Latin American futurists. So I was uh, like um, sticking to that. And then suddenly I was in a classical uh, existential crisis in which I went out from the university and I said, what I'm going to do now? In what am I worked, uh, I will work in. So um, since I had no answer, I was waiting uh, to the job 
to reach to me. So then I started to help her as her assistant, and I begin to get immersed in the futures field, and then voila, it suddenly happened. Uh, I created forward theater, then I specialized into uh, personal futures, and uh, that's how I arrived to the futures field. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you did because uh, you do such beautiful work. Uh, I wanted to, uh, it, and we were talking about your mother is also something else. I guess we can talk a lot longer about, about her, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to stick to, to the question. So uh, I wanted to hear uh, something else. So you put a lot of emphasis on a lot of your work is about teaching people how to build their own personal futures. Why is that? Why do you think it's important that uh, futures become something personal? Well, first, uh, dear Rom, I need to make a confession. I have been into psychotherapy lots of times and the progress has been slow. So if working with the past and the present wasn't working for me, my only salvation and hope was the future. So that's how I decided to specialize in personal futures and ended up like most of those who are now coaches, leaders, uh, and um, something like that. Uh, I instruct others to do that, right? So for me, the subtext of this has always been to seek your own healing through the healing of others. So one of my main quotes is heal the future to in integrate present. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, I, I can't talk much about therapy, but as you can see, I can no longer pull my hair. Uh, so I can go and just, ah, right. Uh, and, and I can engage into healing a different ways. Uh, uh, I don't hit my head on, on the wall too often, but, but sometimes <laughs> I do when I'm, I'm going Ooh. a little bit off. As you know, I am a little bit off, not, not totally off, but just a little bit. So I, I love your work with um, others. And, and I think the future is indeed healing, as, yeah. as you so well put it. So uh, I wanted to change subjects a little bit. And I really want to talk about the Teatro del Devenir or the Forward Theater, right? So could you please ex explain to us what is the Forward Theater and how it helps people learn about the future? Sure. Well, uh, we know that the archetype of uh, futures is the scenario. Uh, so Forward Theater is a methodology to elaborate and communicate, this is really important, to elaborate and communicate scenarios, but in an experiential way. Uh, that is that the scenario doesn't remain written or just reflected, but it's brought to life for a moment. That is uh, that uh, helps people learn to generate three types of scenarios which in this case are utopia, which is like the trend scenario. We have utopia, the best of the best, and dystopia, like the worst of the worst. So uh, these uh, are three scenarios of a specific topic and with an established time horizon. The learning that is generated is significant because they connect emotionally. They connect more profound with this. And they can have a rehearsal of what they could think, feel, and act towards future situations. Now, so, um, for example, can you give me like a practical example? So you have, a, so I love the idea of, of the stage because that, that's where the scenario takes place. So right. you have uh, a situation and the situation can go three different ways. Is this how it works? Yeah, that is, for example, climate change in 2050 mm. in Arizona. Okay, so we, we have the trend scenario, the best and the worst. Yeah, that's how it works. So it's yeah. not not just not just talking about some, you know, hypothetical situation, but you actually do 
help people think about the present and the future and concrete issues, right? Totally. For example, we did a project with women in imprisonment who were about to be out from prison. So with uh, Personal Futures also, we did a forward theater session in which they represented these three possible scenarios when going out from jail, for example, right? So uh, that's how it can be applied in lots of uh, topics and in many ways. This must have been uh, wonderful because I guess they were given the opportunity to think about, well, uh, I need to get a job and what I'm going to go do or where am I going to live? And, and perhaps how will people react to them once they get out of jail, right? Right. Totally. Yeah. So I think this is indeed therapy. So you said, you know, and I know your background is, is there, but I think you're, you're doing some therapy or it's therapeutical in, in, in the latter sense, right? Um, right. I wanted to um, address another topic of uh, the Ford Theater, the Teatro do Devenu, right? So you, in your writings and your teachings and your speeches, you focus a lot on societal peace, right? So how can future studies and the Teatro del Vanier, the Ford Theater, can be tools to promote societal peace? Okay, so um, there's a focus also on personal well-being. So that can derivate in societ so sorry for that <laughs> societal peace, right? Uh, because you uh, work in inner peace and you know general well-being first uh, so theater by itself acts as a societal mirror and sometimes has political components so through forward theater you can show future uh, society worldwide problems and let people reflect and feel especially feel about that topic and there are future studies focus on peace and they are doing a really great labor. So for example, a uh, people from Colombia, from Medellin, which was a really dangerous place years ago. Now they are working with a uh, futures with people of, uh, from the post conflict, for example, and uh, they are uh, working to make a better uh, place to live, a better people to be and all that. So that's an example of how can futures can work to societal peace. Yeah. Now you mentioned uh, Medellin, Colombia, and of course uh, you in Mexico City, you know, one of the largest cities in the world. So I have a comment or question more, more of a question from Facebook. So uh, do you think this methodology, so the Teatro del Veneer, uh, could be applied elsewhere in Latin America where uh, problems are similar, say like Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro, where there's a lot of uh, urban violence and, and, and this sort of... So can the Teatro del de Veneer be uh, transposed into other cultures and other societies? And you think that would also have the same kind of a positive impact? Yeah, totally. Because uh, since forward theater has been applied a lot of times in an academic uh, situation, uh, we use this for communities as the jail example. And uh, we also work years ago for Guatemala uh, in a foundation that was focused on peace. So the, we use forward theater to, to see, to, to watch how can uh, the peace agreements could work forward. Um, so yeah, it, we can use totally this for peace, for, for promoting um, good situations, uh, political stuff. Uh, so yeah, we totally can use this for that and for much more. So I guess we're going to have to think about franchising it and branching it out into other places. I hope we have lots of people who are prepared. It's such a, a, um, a beautiful way of uh, not just the therapy and the healing, 
but I think, I mean, your whole work to promote societal peace using using arts, right? It, I think you touch people in a way that uh, wouldn't be possible or perhaps wouldn't be interesting. So, you know, like say a lecture or something like that, you immerse them in this reality and you help them think through what will happen. And, you know, this can go one way, it can go another way. So I think this is this is some beautiful work that uh, that you do. Thank you so much for your being here and, and sharing with um, the audience. Right, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure. <laughs> so I want to uh, change subjects again on you, and I want to uh, go back to your, your role as a futurist. So we did meet at the conference in Berlin, and you were an executive board member of the WFSF. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. So what? In your belief or in your perspective, what is the value uh, the WFSF actually brings to you uh, and to us and to future studies in general? So the value. Sure. So uh, the WFSF has been a home for me, has been home for me. From all the international and most outstanding futures organizations in the world, the Federation is the only one that has given more space to Latin Americans. Having several Latins, for example, in the board, supporting a Leila projects, which were the Learning Futures Lab projects with UNESCO uh, years ago. Uh, so these projects were uh, applied in the region and much more. So I really appreciate this. And also the Federation has promoted future studies since a long time ago, through events, conferences, publications, the website. Uh, and this has been a, an opportunity to match outstanding and well-known futurists also, and to receive new talents. So that's the value for me. That is indeed a whole lot of value. Uh, also, I'm a believer, but uh, I think it's important that we get uh, different perspectives and, and different points of view to understand what's the work being done and where it has been and hopefully you know, where it will go. So I, I hope others will uh, continue to focus and be interested on WSFF. So uh, I wanted to uh, ask a different kind of question. Uh, so what are you looking at? So what kind of new trends should we be aware of? Well, I will talk about mental health trends, right? Because we have a lot of uh, trends, but uh, to my concern, uh, there are the mental health uh, trends that we need to watch. First, depression and anxiety will be the number one mental disorders in a, within a few years. Actually, with COVID, depression has rise a lot worldwide. So uh, we need to take a look into this. And uh, besides that, there are going to be many psychological disorders. Uh, for example, uh, I insist with COVID, somatization, so having like physical problems, uh, which has a, a mental origin or a psychological origin, will be uh, more present okay since now and uh, also for example we are going to have ne neurological problems uh insomnia and uh, we need to take care of suicide okay and uh, those are like the main trends that we need to watch in a post-covid or a still covid uh Mark, frame, sorry. I'm so glad you raised the issue of, of mental health because I think it's important that we put it out there, right? Uh, so many of us were in isolation for so long, I believe uh, right. 2020, we're right. entering 2022, and it had uh, costed us a very, very heavy toll on, on persons, emotions, relations, and as you said, mental health. So we, we are, I guess this is a worldwide trend increase of you know mental health issues and having to deal with isolation uh fear um, joblessness a uh, variety of, of things that 
I guess in combination, they they become a very, very heavy burden, right? Right, totally. Well, my other question is related. Uh, so basically, uh, what keeps you up at night? So what worries you the most? Well, first, issues related to healing. I'm always thinking in that. And uh, after and besides that, I'm really romantic. So I really spend energy and time trying to figure out why we act in several manners towards love relationships. <laughs> and also my biggest, best, and most important futures project is my son. So I'm really intrigued by reflecting on how can I bring about the healthiest present to leverage it and certainly to avoid catastrophic scenarios. <laughs> Yeah. Well, those catastrophic scenarios, I really need to ask your advice on that because I have a teenager son, right? Oh so uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it is a, a challenge because I think, well, I try to tell him, you know, you do not have to walk in front of a bus to to know that it's a very bad idea. But sometimes he says, well, let me put my foot on the road and say, oh, my God, stop, you know. So if you have any good advice on uh, how to deal with uh, teenagers, I'm all ears, you know. <laughs> Sure, I also I also have personal futures for teens and for parents. <laughs> oh, I guess that's I I think that's healing, that's psychological, that's therapy, that's future, that, that that's really <laughs> all, all all of the above in one pill, I guess. So so no, let's not do pills, no Prozac. Well, let's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. Let's let's yeah. avoid those. Let's talk about things as opposed to pushing pills down uh, people's throats. So uh, uh, I want to ask you a uh, flip side question. So uh, exact. So we talk about the worries, but uh, so I'm um, sorry. Um, what excites you the most about the future? Opportunities, definitely. Um, as mentioned in the beginning, if the past is locked <laughs> and the present is happening too fast, well, you still have the future to change, to improve, to generate opportunities that best suits you with yourself, the surroundings, and with others. So that's it. Yeah. yeah so I'm glad you 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 said that because a lot of people feel um, kind of in some kind of a I'm gonna paraphrase some kind of a jail because they believe in fate or the future is written. And I guess what you're saying is it is not written, right? We we are working on it. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are victims of our own uh, thoughts and feelings. Yeah. So we, so it's working progress. We are, we're gonna get there, right? Right. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Right. And it's a good place. <laughs> and it's a good place. Okay. It, and it's a long path, but we can be in the way. <laughs> we certainly are, and, and with yeah. your thoughts and ideas, I think will help us think about uh, a, a good direction. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you a different kind of question. So uh, you touched on future, you touched on art, you touched on therapy. You have so many different passions, right? Uh, so I want to go back to your work on, on specifically on the theater project or projects. And in your writings, you mentioned, you know, experiential activities like, like uh, scenery or, and the arts and the theater and they can be used to train anticipatory skills, right? And those are very important. So can you explain how it works? How is it that, you know, the scenic arts or art in general or the Teatro del Veneer help us create or exercise those so, or learn those so important anticipatory skills? Sure. Well, I'm a great promoter of meaningful learning. So for me, one of the best ways to learn is learning by doing. So I train anticipatory skills while teaching methods, techniques, tools of the future field. So at the same time, skills, methods, and the other stuff. So I do this through creative, playful, corporal, and 
interactive dynamics. So in this way, you keep the trainees awake and generate meaningful learning. So skills are really important to build futures. So folks, I think this is, uh, this is an important point and, and one point that we made at, uh, at the beginning. So this is about skills building. So when you talk about uh, futures, it's not just some in imaginary point in time. It is a skill, a skill that needs to be learned, needs to be taught, but most importantly, it needs to be experienced and it can be materialized. And like Professor you know, Montero Baena explains here, you can do that uh, through art, you can do that through therapy, you can do that through you know, vocalization. There are many ways, whichever way, whichever path you decide. I think there are, what Professor Montero is explaining is, this is one of the paths, and, and I believe it's an experiential path. I think it's something fun uh, for us to engage with. So I, I see, I'm sorry, go ahead. Totally, you relax and play and have fun. So that way learning is better, right? Oh, yes. Fun with learning. Yes. Sign me up. <laughs> well, I, I, I can't let you go. You have so many books behind you. So I want to ask you to ask you a question. What are you reading? And can you recommend me a good book? Sure. I'm reading uh, the Somatic Experience, Somatic Experience from Stanley Kellerman. Uh, this book talks about how uh, what we were talking about, how uh, the disorders express through the body. And the book that I recommend is this one. Well, this is the Spanish version, but uh, of course, there is the English version, which is called It's Your Future, Make It a Good One. So it's the Personal Futures book that also has a workbook, but this is really, really nice to work in if you are not in a workshop or in a personal futures process you can read this book <laughs> thank you and i think this is important it's a very important point that you touched upon uh, so people uh, usually think about well is this some kind of a sugary you know feel good kind of a book no no so folks if you go to you know professor montero's workshops or to dr berkham's uh, workshops workshops they are filled with activities, you know, thought-provoking questions, exercises. So the growth you know, will come out of you know, questioning and exercising and, and teaching and learning and acting and putting all this stuff together. So thank you so much for reminding us, you know, all those activities and questions and thought-provoking questions. That's what makes us grow. It may be a little bit painful, right? But uh, that's how we grow, I guess. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, well, um, uh, don't know how to thank you. So thank you so very much. Muchísimas gracias for your time today. Uh, it has been uh, a, a wonderful uh, time, and I'm certain I will actually write down the name of the book, The Personal Futures, down here. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it can be found on Amazon. As to Futuro yeah. or Personal Futures, we can find it on Amazon.com. So. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> uh, we'll uh, be able to uh, to find it somewhere. Again, uh, Professor Anissa Montero Baena, thank you so very much for your time today. Thanks to you, Rom, and congratulations for this space, for your time, and for you being in the future. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks to the audience. Thank you. So uh, let's uh, uh, go back to the agenda. So we had our introduction. Uh, we had uh, the wonderful pleasure of speaking with uh, Professor Dicia Montero Baena. And now I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Stefan Bergheim. Let me pull um, uh, uh, the slide on him. You may remember I will actually add, I uh, had a different interview with him. He came into Books and Autos, where we had the opportunity to talk a little bit about his new book, which is out, Futures Open to a variety. So I will add that link to the um, to the posting or to the comment section so you can uh, take a look. So Dr. Stefan Bergheim is the co-founder of Zukunfte, which means futures, uh, where he designs futures literacy laboratories for corporations, for academia, for governmental institutions, 
Now I'm going to ask him about uh, personal futures as well in a moment. Uh, he is also the director of the Center for Societal Progress, or ZGF, in Frankfurt, where he researches quality of life. He is an author, speaker, researcher, and he works to advance futures literacy uh, for UNESCO. So let me uh, bring him um, into the show, uh, Dr. Bergheim. Sehr herzlich willkommen. Wonderful to have you here again. Vielen Dank. Multilingual warm so Thank you for having me. It's muss mein Deutsch verbessern. I'm learning oh. and, and I, I hope uh, I can do much better someday. <laughs> well, uh, I, I hope we didn't botch the introduction too much, but if, if I missed something uh, important that I should have mentioned and I have not, please uh, share something uh, a bit more about you. Well, yeah, you, you were kind enough to not mention my past in the financial industry, um, which is not as popular nowadays as it used to be 20 years ago or so when, when I was there, because I, I used to work in, in banking, which is maybe important uh, considering the futures work. And maybe I was, as an economist working in, in the financial industry, already a futurist actually back then when I did forecasts. I created a lot of forecasts for gross domestic product, for inflation, for interest rates, and, and so on. Um, why did I do that? Uh, because there was a demand out there. There are a lot of people out there who need to invest their money uh, and who want to know, uh, want to understand better what the future might bring. So that's the, the reason, the, the why, and, and you, you introduced future literacy, the de definition of it, knowing why and how to use, and how, uh, what, what I did back then, was using numbers, numbers coming from the past, extrapolating them and building big models, um, lots of data um, to you know, forecast what the future will bring. We, we're very proud of us having the best forecast around. Wonderful. And uh, I should uh, give some, some people some forewarning. When you have two economists together, it's not uncommon. <laughs> for you to come up with uh, three and sometimes four dissenting opinions. So uh, we'll, we'll try to keep it sane and polite and decent or else uh, people will start uh, getting mad over us. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, I wanted to uh, get to know you more as a futurist. Like, so tell us a little bit about the ZGF and your role there. You are the lead researcher as well. So what kind of research do you do at the ZGF? Well, the, the impulse for starting this think tank on societal progress or well-being, quality of life, um, th this kind of topics came from uh, my time in, in, still in the financial industry when I looked beyond GDP, beyond gross domestic product. What else is out there that can help us measure how well we're doing? How good a society are we? So I, I wrote a lot of um, reports back then on measures of well-being and the happy variety of, of capitalism and, and so on and so forth. And I noticed that my home country, Germany, is not doing as well as some of the other countries, especially the, the Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands, uh, Switzerland. Um, so I, I basically quit my job to um, pull, push an agenda for more well-being, for a higher quality of life. Um, in, in Germany. Um, so I kind of, yeah, I had a vision. I, I, I had um, an, an image of a preferred future, which was basically using the, the numbers um, that I was good at uh, back, back then, uh, using numbers to, to find out what is high quality of life. And I said, let's, let's go and promote that. Uh, let's push that vision. So that was the, the impulse, uh, but very early in, in um, the, the work at the Center for Societal Progress, I got a lot of impulses saying, well, it's good if you push the agenda yourself, but what about involving a lot of people in the creation of vision, so a collective intelligence uh, process, which is helpful because then there's a larger buy-in, maybe there's a lot more credibility in the visions that are created. Um, so let's go involve a lot of people, uh, a lot of different people, and especially hear some of the seldom heard voices. So I, I spread further and further into that. And we had uh, processes, uh, quality of life uh, processes, where we ask a lot of people, so what's important to you in your life? Um, what kind of future would you like to have? And we 
uh, condensed all those uh, individual visions into collective visions for city, for country, or on, on digital quality of life, and also created indicators. So I'm, I'm not letting go of those, those quant elements. We always also try to find indicators to measure how far ahead we are towards that vision. So it's a normative way very much. Uh, and the, uh, the why we're doing is is basically to push an agenda to lobby for for more uh, quality of life and the how we're doing it uh, have been doing and still are doing is involve a lot of people go, go into dialogue uh, ask uh, questions and discover what people's wishes are and folks so the center for societal progress the zgf uh, is online i'm gonna add the the link here and Dr. Berkheim's work is really impressive, and I'm, you know, I'm always amazed to see your work. And specifically, you help us think about society not so much in, in, in GDP terms. Yes, we all know the GDP, but what about the quality of life? And is, is that really improving? And what, what is that we as people value as quality of life? And something, and you, you mentioned en passant, as the, the French say, by the way. Uh, but I think it's important because you seek to hear voices that are you know, seldom heard. And I think that's an important aspect uh, that actually we, it's an example we should emulate <laughs> to think about those voices. Well, um, voices that were not included. And I know you're always a big advocate for diversity and you're always advocating diversity and in including people into the debate. And I think that's the, one of the beauties of your work is calling our attention uh, to voices that, you know, have not been heard or not heard enough. And, and perhaps we're so busy on admiring the beauty of the mathematical models. Is we forgot it's, it's not about the models. It's about the people, the people we ultimately serve, right? Yeah, absolutely. And whatever I do, I always ask, so who's in the room? Who's included in the process? That's important to know. But I also ask who's not in the room? And is there a reason why they're not included? Maybe some, uh, sometimes, of course, it's not possible to have everyone in the same room at the same time. That's, that's too difficult. But at least be conscious of who you're include, excluding and think about ways of how to include maybe some more people than the usual suspects, I, I call them. Uh, unfortunately, I guess we default to the usual suspects quite often, and it, it's hard to think about um, which ones we have excluded, and sometimes by design, right? And that's the saddest part, I guess. We intended not to include people. And I think it's important because you help us think about our own biases and our own the, the fallacies of our own studies as you push your view in terms of, you know, you have to be aware of what you're doing and you are not bringing or who you're bringing and why. So thank you. That, that's that's beautiful work that you do. So uh, I wanted to, uh, so topic of the show is futures literacy and you dedicate a lot of your time to futures literacy. So why? Why do you consider it such a valuable tool or so important that so much of your time is dedicated to futures literacy? Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to tell because I, I met uh, Riel Miller, who you, you quoted at the beginning, who's uh, at UNESCO uh, now. I, I met him about 13 years ago or so, and, and he actually uh, gave the opening speech for the Center for Societal Progress opening ceremony in 2009 or so. Um, so I was always fascinated with the work he did. Uh, and over the years, I, I think I better and better understand what this is all about. And my current understanding of, of the value of, of futures literacy is uh, that there is a really solid theory uh, behind how we humans uh, use the future. Um, and the theory is called the theory of, of anticipation. Uh, and the essence, as far as I understand it, is that uh, what we are doing today, uh, not actually not just us humans, but all living beings actually, uh, what we're doing today depends on our assumptions about the future. Um, from those assumptions, we build images, constructs of, of the future of ourselves and of our environment. Um, so those assumptions, the, the, being the core building block of what we do. So that's one, one, one crucial element that helped me make sense of all the other things that I see across the futures field. And actually even 
um, going back to my banking and forecasting days, well, of course, there were assumptions in there. There is the assumption that the future will be more or less similar to the past. That's a very strong, powerful assumption that maybe we were conscious about, maybe we were not uh, as conscious of, as we could be. So the, the assumptions element is, is crucial, and the other element that, that I love so much is well, the, the flexibility uh, of, of it. You can use it in, in different ways, in different formats, but then it, it basically opens your mind to think about the future in, in, in such a way. Uh, it, it opens a lot more options if you investigate your assumptions and say, aha, this is interesting that I have that assumption. How about if it's wrong? How about uh, thinking of an alternative assumption where I have no idea whether it's right or wrong because it refers to the future and no one has ever been there. So we can't tell really, but at least just play with it. Let's experiment with alternative futures. Uh, and then it creates a lot more options than if you just simply extrapolate the past. Yes. So I have a, a, a different kind of question uh, from the audience. So could you let us know what kind of uh, literacy or futures literacy programs are being offered to countries where the level of, of education is considered to be below average? So they have issues about in education proper, not mm -hmm. to mention future literacy, right? And the programs uh, that are more implemented in which countries, uh, could you mention some of them or in your experience, uh, what happens to futures literacy in countries that are not as well developed? Well, uh, I mean, we're starting with a big question. What, what does it mean to be well developed? Uh, mm -hmm. I, we have in Germany a lot of problems in our education uh, sector as well. So that's not unique to, to specific countries. And futures literacy is a universal competency. We can start wherever people are. So it's, it's I think initially it's important to consider how far along are people, how far along is the understanding of how they're using the future. We all use the future all, all the time, but sometimes, or many times, um, not as consciously as, as we could. And then just, just start from there. And as, as I mentioned, or you mentioned at the beginning as well, UNESCO is, is heading, uh, spearheading the, the effort to, to spread future literacy around the world. And there, is, there are many um, projects in, in Tunisia, in Uruguay. There's a lot going on in the Philippines. And, and this says, give me a country and we can link you to a local future literacy expert who can tell you a lot more on, on what's going on. So it's universal happening and a lot of things are happening around the globe. Indeed. So I wanted to go back to uh, a little bit of um, your own work and Zukunfte as well. Could you please explain what are the future literacy labs? Uh, how can they be used to uh, strengthen future literacy? So futures mm. literacy labs. Yeah, those futures literacy laboratories are the main tool, the main method we're using to well, strengthen future literacy, as, as you mentioned, to, to help people understand the different ways and reasons uh, for using the future or for imagining uh, the, the future. So then the main tool also to make visible, to reveal those assumptions that people hold about the future that, that I mentioned earlier. And the way it, it works, it has, most of the time, it has four phases. Uh, in the first phase, we invite, and it's, it's, it's a collective intelligent knowledge creation process. So there's a lot of people involved. And my role mostly there is to design a process, a, a lab specifically for the context at hand and for the participants that will be there and for the topic um, that, that is chosen, like the future of work, the future of leadership, or what, what have you, uh, and bring people into a conversation first about their expectations about the future, so basically their, their forecasts, uh, what is likely to happen in their view in the future of the topic, so maybe 10, 20 years down, down the road, and they talk, they first think about it, imagine for themselves, aha, uh -huh, that could be something where I'm pretty sure that this is going to happen, and then they share it most of, in, in most labs in small groups, and then we make it visible what, what all of those forecasts are about. And then still in this revealing assumptions uh, phase, 
We also ask participants about their desirable futures, uh, what kind of future they want to live in. Often we do a mind travel journey, so you close your eyes, you think about the future of the topic and, and so on, uh, and people come back and, and share um, their images of a desirable future. So that's kind of classic way of forecasting and envisioning and the to me, novel um, and, and amazing um, uh, element of a future literacy laboratory is the second phase, phase two, where we reframe the, the futures of participants. We go beyond the uh, likely and the desirable futures. We take some of the assumptions that they uh, revealed in the first phase and either take them away, like when we talk about the future of education, and we take away the assumption that there are still schools in the year 2040. Uh, and then they are invited to, oh gosh, well, what might uh, education look like if there is no schools? Or we bring in a new assumption, a new capability, for example, um, uh, or we flip around the sign of some of the assumptions that, that people, people are making. So we, we give people an alternative future that is neither desirable, undesirable, nor likely, unlikely. We don't know. No one has, has ever been there. So we give them a future. And actually, in some of the laboratories, we even ask participants to create those alternative futures themselves and then hand it over to the next group, and they will fill in the details. That's even, even more fascinating and even harder. So it's, a, it's not trivial. Very few people have ever done that, uh, creating an alternative future or, or filling in the details into an alternative future that we're giving them. Um, so, and then we have three different futures. We have the, the, the likely, the desirable, and the alternative future, which broadens up perspectives even, even further. And with that, we go into the, the third phase that um, Alicia also, also mentioned uh, questions are, are important. So you look at all those um, uh, different futures and you rethink the topic based on that wider, bigger uh, information base. And you, you rethink, you ask new questions. Questions are so crucial, <laughs> so important, and people develop new questions, share with each other. And from those questions, in, in many labs, we even go into phase four, a redo, an, an, an action phase, uh, where people pick some specific questions, say, aha, that's a really interesting question. And from that question, uh, there's actually a quest developing for me, something I really, really want to follow up on after this laboratory. Um, yeah, and that's that's th those those four phases, and it's amazing how much uh, in, um, insights are generated in, in any of those laboratories. It's, it's great fun designing, facilitating those. Uh, now, so specifically, you have the uh, Comfort Building training coming up in January, and I believe in February. I will actually add the link to that if people want to participate. So do you run laboratories in, in this specific training as well? Well, the, the training what we're doing in German, actually, only this time, but maybe in English uh, later on, the training is for people who have experienced a future citizen laboratory, who've, who've seen the value. And so also what, what Alicia mentioned, it's, it's in the experience, the, the involvement, the engaging with the future, with others together. So who, who've been through this experience and who, who who appreciated it, liked it, and want to design and facilitate laboratories themselves, want to oh, be wonderful. facilitators. That's the, the focus of that, of that training. The other is an experience, and this is really a, a training where we go through the different ways of, of running the first phase, the different reasons why we're using a reframe, and the different ways of doing a reframe, and the different um, um, customers we have or the different uh, local champions, we call them partners, who, who host those labs and how you facilitate if, if people are not uh, sharing or if people are dominating and, and all these yeah. these kinds of things are uh, very practical so that after the training, they're all able to, to run uh, those labs themselves. So that's basically a train the trainer kind of seminar Indeed. where you enabling yeah. others to teach them how to fish, basically. Yeah, yeah. I teach them how, how to run, how to facilit facilitate, because there's just so much demand uh, here for, for laboratories that it can no longer be just a small group of, of, of four or five people. 
in the Zukunft uh, uh, team. I think we need a lot more people who, and, and who will all find different opportunities in, in their specific context where they can make good use of, of those skills. I, that, that's at least my hope. That's my desirable future <laughs> for futures that you see in the German speaking countries. Teach others how to fish and hopefully, you know, more fish will show up, I guess. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, well, you know me, I uh, have esoteric questions as well. So, uh, you know, some people do advocate we should use more images or imagery or concepts, you know, other forms of representation to help us, you know, materialize our views of the future or to foster creativity, for instance, mm -hmm. right? So is that so? Uh, what's your perspective or advice? Should we, what can we do to help us materialize those visions of the future? Well, well, absolutely. We, we, sh we should tr try anything possible to, to go into this imagining the future. I mean, as, as, as I mentioned, the, the assumptions um, that we all have about the future are the building blocks of our images of the future. And they are powerful in, in steering what we do today. But how can we make visible or reveal those images? Uh, well, one th way would be just to draw. Uh, to go into mind travel, which we often do in, in this desirable future phase, ask people to mind travel and then come back and, and draw their images from the images are in your mind. The mind travel and you, you, you see things, you see futures in there. And then we ask people to, to draw it and share it with the others. So what did you see in your, in your image? Um, sometimes we ask people to create characters, um, also online or, or on site, uh, characters that represent the future, that have some strengths and some shapes and, and some colors. And what does this future look like if it were a character? Uh, so that's a possibility. And th another one that, that I love using, uh, others use different, we also use theater, in improvisation theater. Um, but what I love to, to do with, with participants in our labs, especially in the second phase, is to build sculptures of the future. So people work with their hands. We give them some dough, some, some um, Playmobil um, figures and some, some other stuff to, to create sculptures. And that helps them discuss what their values are, why they see this and how it connects. And one person talks about what they've created and then they say, oh yeah, that's interesting. And that makes me think of that. And I'll add another one and it gets the, the conversation flowing. So yes, images are important and even actually even, even more so in, in German uh, because Bildung, um, we, we call it in German, we call it Zukunfte, so plural futures, Bildung. And Bildung is basically from build an image. So the images that we have of the future, we, well, we actually even use it in, in the German labeling of futures literacy as Zukunft Bildung. Uh, hopefully they're not building voodoo dolls. They're using Legos for other, other means, right? So folks, that's not voodoo dolls building. They're building <laughs> something else, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, I have to put you on the spot uh, because we, you know, you mentioned art again. And uh, I, uh, so, I didn't, did not know what uh, Professor Montero Baena was going to say, but she talked a lot about art and she talked about it in the context of uh, uh, helping people deal with, with violence. So uh, mm. I want to ask a very different esoteric kind of question. You know me and uh, she's around, so perhaps I should, uh, should uh, bring her for this uh, esoteric kind of question. But she mentioned uh, the Teatro del Venir and the Foreign Theater and how it helps uh, promote societal peace. So I want to ask a very specific uh, German question. So Germany dealt with quite a lot of violence. So I I'm talking about the Badermeinhof, right? There was a lot of urban violence in Germany, not 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 so long ago. So uh, do you think uh, those approaches, uh, like you know, Professor Montero suggested? the theater, the arts, or, or uh, maybe engaging or, or building sculptures or so what what are the tools or what you see as viable in, in your society as a tool to promote societal peace? And I will let Professor Montero add if she wants to say adds to the question. I think it's a, already a long question, but if <sighs> Well, well, I mean, yeah, it, it's it's maybe a question for for another show, e even because there's a lot uh, to be to be talked about here. One is to, to just ha have 
or give people a say, uh, give people a, an opportunity to talk about their experiences. That that that's crucial in, in why they went this way. And in, in, in Germany, we have we obviously have an, an even bigger uh, history of, of violence uh, with two world wars being being fought here and, and the heavy involvement, which which had. A, a major impact on the the baby boom generation in the late 1930s, for example, who grew up without uh, a father and bombed out cities. Uh, the trauma is is, is important, uh, and there's stuff that was never ever talked about uh, that is still influencing our images of the future. If if you grow up uh, in in such an environment and you rebuild the country. The, your main priority is a never again and a, a priority for stability um, and and for um, for for um, clarity about what what you want to do. Uh, it's it clearly determines what how you act in the present and making that again visible. Why are you acting today the way you are? Where what are the sources of your assumptions about the future? And then we come to to exactly those. Those issues that, that you're mentioning, on or in, in Eastern Germany, um, the uh, uh, socialist um, uh, era there had a major impact on what people are are, are experiencing there and are doing there. Professor Montero, I don't know if you want to add or, or redirect the question, but you know. No, sure. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to say that uh, materializing futures. Either if it's, you know, plays, uh, sculptures, I use, for example, Legos or something like that. Um, uh, I uh, generate vision boards. I know Stefan has done some, mm. some kind of similar things also. So when you materialize, the important thing is uh, first to move from vision to action because it's not the same that the future images stay on the mind than to look at them. So the, the second important thing is that when you materialize, the feel is to be closer to the, the future that you are uh, generating, to be closer, because they are like a <clears throat> reality spots, mm -hmm. okay? You are not looking just that on the mind, but you are looking, you know, in in some real stuff. So uh, I I have uh, learned that people, when are doing this, they find sense. Mm -hmm. They find sense, sense in what they are doing, in what they are building, in what they are uh, reflecting. So a future doesn't seem as uncertain as it could be. So um, certainly uh, Latin America sees a lot of violence, uh, but not in the scale that Germany felt the total destruction, for example. Now, uh, in both of your perspectives, uh, could the sculptures, the, the scenic arts, the materialization of the future be transposed to other cultures? So let's say um, Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan, where quote, total destruction has also happened and violence still run, it runs amok. Could, could the experiences in Latin America and in Germany be of help or those tools, could they be useful in places like Syria, Lebanon, Afghanistan, for example? I would certainly think so, think so, and I would hope that they are, but it requires uh, some hosting organization or some way where this or some place where this can happen, some resources, some organization that um, makes that possible. That's that's the the, the hurdle, the stumbling block, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I also think it's possible, but you certainly need trained people for that. For example, I I usually don't recommend anyone to apply forward theater just like that. I mm. recommend to have uh, at least a little background in a uh, no uh, getting to know emotions and psychological stuff because really things happen people can suddenly start crying or laughing or uh, loudly or something like that and you need to know how to do uh, what to do with that 
So imagine working with this kind of people really needs an important training on this. You need to be prepared psychologically, you to guide, mm -hmm. but also to have a, some knowledge for this because you are working with very, very sensitive uh, points of the people. So you re really need to take care of that. So it looks like we, we need another train the trainer. We need you guys to talk about how we're going to you know, work together to facilitate and teach more people to fish, or, you know, not just on the futures, but uh, adding the, um, the art. Uh, I, I want to keep you uh, both uh, together. So I'm going to ask Dr. Bergheim a different kind of question. Uh, so you were the co-curator of the 24th conference in Berlin, right? And that team was the openness of future. So, so why did you select that particular theme for the conference? Why is that important, the openness of the futures? Well, as, as a futurist, I think it's a, it's a natural. Um, the, the future is open, basically by, by definition. There's It's a complex universe, and we cannot tell, as we just discussed, what the future will bring, really. We can't know. It, it is open. Uh, we have our wishes, we have our desires, but in general, it, it's open. And the futurist field itself is also a very open field. We have different backgrounds, we have, as, as we're just discovering here. Uh, different uh, path that that um, took us here. Uh, we're open to different participants uh, that, that, that we involve in, in our projects. We're open to the outcomes of, of those projects and not um, settling on, on just one uh, specific thing that, that can happen. And, and even more, as I mentioned, in, especially in the Future Citizy Labs, but I, I think in every futures related interaction, it opens your minds. It opens the menu of choices that that is uh, that, that is being being created. So there's a lot of openness elements in, in futures, and for that conference, it was basically chosen to to have a platform, um, a space for everyone to contribute: the young, the old, the the newcomers, the experienced futurists, the academicians, the the practitioners. Uh, they were all invited by partly, I hope, by the slogan of the the openness. Is that your perspective too, Professor Mantira? Well, uh, we have uh, we had something to discuss when we were uh, uh, organizing this because uh, some Latin members were not sure about the openness because mm. uh, they seem uh, the opportunity to be in the conference so far. So, so that was a, a polemic uh, issue to deal with. And we still need to work on that to make uh, some uh, more strategies in order to make more openness, <laughs> right? To be more open. And uh, uh, but besides that, uh, the topics and the issues that are covered and the, the, all the the people's or the futurist perspectives are very, you know, like uh, nutritive for this. And, and that was actually at, at the end of the conference, it was a recurring theme as well. We need to be more open, e even more open, um, if, if that's at all possible to more countries, to more areas, to maybe the corporate world, the, the more disadvantaged people. And, and that's our challenge to find ways of how to do that. Maybe it doesn't have to be at that at, at a conference. Maybe these voices, these perspectives can also be brought in in different ways and different areas where conferences are happening. It's a recurring topic, absolutely. And also to intergenerational uh, mm. opportunities, you know, kids, mm. teens and all that. Mm. Yeah. So uh, your question for you both. So what were the key takeaways from the 24th WFSF in <laughs> Berlin? What, in your perspective, the things that really came out clear? Alita, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, well, first, uh, the importance of futures in COVID times, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there were a lot of comments, of course, um, the, um, about these the uh, the use of futures through, uh, for example, COVID things, right? Uh, to uh, to be a structure again, to uh, build better futures, what's going to happen after and the still with COVID and all that. So the importance of, of futures in these times, right? Uh, then um, 
the, um, the importance of still being together now in a hybrid uh, way, right? Because we were together where there were some people in person, but then we were some in person and, and then others uh, through a screen. So the importance of being together, generate this collective intelligence and, and not just to th reflect on this, but to feel collectively uh, through this organization, but about the futures field, the future of the futures field mm -hmm. and also the futures of futurists. And, and also, I'm, I'm fully with you, and also the importance of there being an organization that hosts this coming together, that acts as an umbrella organization. You mentioned earlier the, the importance of the World Future Studies <laughs> Federation as a place where people can meet as an organizer of conferences like this in person, online, all sorts of different uh, ways of connecting across the field. Thank you so much. And again, Professor Monteiro, thank you for hanging around because I, I, some of the questions I wanted to address both of you, or I'd like you, both of you to address because I think you have different perspectives and, and you are part of this beautiful house that we are all co-constructing. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel it's, it's a welcoming place for all. So I will, thanks again, Professor Monteiro. I will uh, continue. Um, I wanted to talk to uh, Dr. Bergheim a little bit again about you, as a writer. So um, what motivates you? So why why do you write? Well, I've, I think I've, I've always written, I mean, in, in, in the financial industry, I, I, I wrote because I wanted my clients to read my um, smart insights. Uh, in At the Center for Societal Progress, I wanted um, people to read about what, what we're doing, uh, share the results of the processes that, that we did, uh, share the indicators, share, share the visions um, that, that we have. And, and most recently, as, as a writer of, of, of a book, I just wanted to bring, especially well, the, the, the book um, that you showed at the beginning was originally a, a German language uh, project, where my intention was to bring those ideas of futures literacy into my home country or neighboring countries as, as well, uh, Switzerland, Austria as well. Um, Germany is, is a pretty hierarchical uh, country. It's an engineering type of country. It's a plan, predict, control uh, kind of country um, where we're not really used to these this kind of images, imagination, playful ways of, of using the future. And I just wanted to, to share my insights, um, my experience with, with all of this. In, in the German speaking countries and, and see what happens if I, if I put up a book and, and see who, who, who reads it and who reacts to it. That's actually the most fun when, when people come back and say, oh, I, I read your book, that's interesting. Uh, what can I do? And, and my impulse also in the book was to encourage people to do futures work, a low, um, small scale, practical, begin someplace where, where, it's, where it's feasible for, for each individual. And only later I, I translated it into English and made some adjustments so, so that uh, non-German speakers and not as familiar with the German scenery uh, would also uh, understand it. And, and there the idea is to uh, yeah, spread future literacy in an easier to understand uh, way um, also globally. And, uh, and same here, people uh, call me from Australia and New Zealand and say, well, I, I read your book, um, fascinating, I'm, I'm using it now. So that's very gratifying as well. Wonderful. So let's talk uh, uh, a little bit about that book again. So uh, Dr. Bergheim has a different interview in Books and Authors where we had the opportunity to discuss this book at greater length. But again, folks, that is Future or Futures, Open mm -hmm. to a Variety, a manual for the wise use of the later than now. And for the folks in Germany, it's Zukunft, often for Vielfalt, uh, both are available in Amazon.com or Amazon.de. So could you tell us a little bit about this book? What is the book all about? Well, it's, it's a, a hands-on practical guide that is based on some a some, some theory um, of it. So I go, I go into um, German systems theory, uh, hope to make it lightweight and easy, easy to understand, a bit of Niklas Luhmann, the, the sociologist, a bit of dialogue uh, theory. Um, so th that's at the beginning. Um, the, 
um, th that part. And then I move into different ways, actually, yeah, of, of using the future. Um, I have a chapter on, on trend analysis, so extrapolating the past. There is also a chapter on scenarios and when, when they are helpful. Um, there's a chapter on, on future search, and obviously there's a chapter on a futures literacy laboratory, and also one on, on causal layered analysis that Sohail Inayatula uh, proposed. And I'm, in each chapter on the methods, I'm explaining what it's about the method um, and my experience. Uh, it's a very personal um, um, book as well. Each chapter starts with, with a personal in interaction with uh, someone, either a participant or the author of, of the method. Uh, and um, I, I explain different ways of, of possibilities of using the method. Um, and the, the third section of the book is just sharing experiences from uh, my uses of different um, methods and from the larger processes that I designed for the Center for Societal Progress and that, that I led and also want to advise the, the national government on their national well-being strategy and this quality of life in the digital age. So very practical things where I hope people can, can read it and say, aha, I have a similar issue in my futures engagement. Well, why not try uh, one of those suggestions that, that Stefan has in his book? That, that's all. Um, I'm not telling anyone to do it exactly that way. I'm open up, opening up a lot of possibilities of different ways of using the future. You know, you just mentioned something that now I'm going to have to uh, call you for another entire hour, I guess. But uh, uh, Nicholas Luhmann, and you mentioned his work as a sociologist. I usually, in, and he was a philosopher and sociologist, but I usually use his materials to help me build stories, create metaphors because of his memorization tools and techniques. So I think we should have a, a whole discussion on, on him, but I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm going to yeah. cut you off. No, totally. I mean, I use it mostly from to help me understand the different languages and incentive structures within different systems in societies. And I'm running the Center for Societal Progress, but society consists of different um, sub areas like uh, polit politics, business, uh, science, media, and so on and so forth. And why it's so difficult for them to communicate with each other. That was my main learning from my work. But yeah. Yeah, it would be fascinating to, to explore our different uh, angles of approaching Luhmann. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because people, at least in this side of the pond, don't, don't hear much about Luhmann. Yeah. And I think, no, no, you really have to learn and understand and, and, and apply it, you know, in a Zetel Kashan. So for them, it translates into Rolodex here. Uh, but it, it's amazing. And I think, oh, wow the way you organize your thoughts you can you know intrinsically find new things from the things you already knew it's through combination of thoughts and ideas and saying well this is fantastic you know uh you know i love it yeah we, we have to talk more about it and, and i actually see you have more books so my question to you is what are you reading and can you recommend a book well yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm reading lots on, on, on happiness, on futures, on, on complexity, and, and also on, on how to bring people together in having meaningful conversations about the future. And, and the last book I've, I've read with, with a lot of joy was The, the Art of, of Gathering by Priya Parker, is, is her name, uh, who tells us what to do, well, how we meet, and why it matters is the subtitle here. And, and she has so much experience and, and such great ideas. I mean, I've, I've been a facilitator now for 12, 13 plus years. Uh, and I did learn a lot from, from how she does it. So that's my, my recent aha reading uh, experience, Priya Parker's Out of Gathering. Oh, thank you so much. It's always good to ask someone who reads about another book because I know something good's gonna come out. And so, yeah, <laughs> I have to put that on the list. Uh, well, hey, hey, it's it's Christmas time. It's end of the year. It's Hanukkah. So, folks, if you need to find good books, you know, futures open to variety, and the new one from Priya, we we have lots lots of books uh, to read. And of course, I could ask you a boatload more questions, uh, but I'm afraid that I can't. Uh, impose on you anymore uh, i can't ask for more it was such a, a as always such a such a, a great talk so thank you dr stefan berenheim and i really um, hope to see you soon 
yeah, thank you so much for, for having me and thank you for your, your great work on promoting futures in, in your show. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think that's the, the least I can do is to promote it. Uh, here they say it's the Kool-Aid that you're drinking, but I, I don't think it's Kool-Aid. <laughs> I think it's, you know, Professor Montero said, no, it's therapeutic, it helps. In my case, I can't, I can't pull my hair anymore, so I need some kind, other kind of therapy, so futures helps. And uh, maybe I'll try sculptures, uh, and no voodoo dolls, just, just sculptures and play mobiles and, and things like that. Yeah. But uh, uh, I really think the work that uh, you guys do is, is fantastic, and that's why I'm so happy that you could, you know, set a time some... Uh, some of your time from your busy schedules to be here and to share with me and the audience so don't know how to thank you both enough so thank you again thank you so uh, again let's uh pull that uh, uh, that information for you guys it's uh, available on amazon.com futures open to a variety so please uh, go and take a look and uh check it out a lot of stuff uh, we can talk about more about these books and again i will add uh, the link to amazon uh, so that you can see it and you can find it uh, very easily and very uh, conveniently uh actually uh silver cotton was uh, uh thank you both and uh, sylvain saying uh thanks for all the discussion have a nice christmas uh, merry christmas happy hanukkah uh to all of uh you as well so let's talk a little bit about the uh, coming agenda uh our good friend uh, and also future Zhango is going to be here to talk about speculative fabulation so how we're going to speculate about the future uh we have dr maria hofaker who is also has a, a very interesting uh, podcast that one is nad nur of deutsch but it's fantastic uh, lovely stuff very interesting guests and and she is a great communicator so very fun podcast. I would certainly add that to the list of uh, must hear or must watch uh, podcasts. Uh, we'll continue to work on the topics that you keep uh, sending me uh, feedback on. So more on technology, uses of technology, more on the metaverse. I actually love that Iceland uh, commercial. I loved it. Uh, so not, not so much metaverse, maybe this, this Icelandic verse. Uh, more about sustainability. Sustainability is a topic, a constant focus of my guests. They all come back to the idea of a feasible future, you know, a real future, not not some some imaginary dystopia where you know we have come to the end of the world, but we have to put some effort and some uh, calories into it. Uh, Joyce Joy, author of the Herman newsletter, will be here as well. And gosh, there are several uh, interesting events coming up. Markets and Markets has a series of roundtables where they're going to be discussing the future of, and they're going to uh, you know, talk to CEOs and CFOs and, and CTOs, switchers of technology, where, where we're going. So that should be very interesting. Uh, then Frosten Sullivan has a whole show about innovation and how to manage innovation, how to uh, cause more innovation to take place and more fun. And the ICI, Institute of, Institute of Competitive Intelligence, also out of Frankfurt, has another conference. So we will uh, have more fun things to discuss and more things to talk about. Uh, it seems uh, we are coming to the end of the show. So I really, again, uh, one more time, I wanted to thank you so very much for your presence and uh, for your participation in the show today. Thank you so much for my guests, uh, Professor Alicia Montero Baena, muchas gracias, Dr. Stefan Bergheim, Danke schön, merci, vielmals, uh, for your being here with me and, and the audience today. You can always reach out to the magazine or to me, the host via Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and of course, the YouTube channel is available. If you are listening to this as a podcast and you are not live or to Futures Television or as a recording, you too can be part of the conversation just go to the youtube channel leave your thoughts and comments and questions and we will get to it uh, again i hope to see you soon uh, in one of the upcoming shows and i will leave you with our institutional message thank you <music>